Michael will give us a second talk. So I did want to start by uh, thanking uh, Roger, Nia, and Julia. Initially, I thanked them for having the meeting. Now I have to thank them halfway along for making this such an amazing meeting. The talks have been terrific. All the location, the hall, food, questions, Probably one of the best minutes I've ever been to in my life. So, uh, it, it's a, and I've been to a lot. That's, that's good. Okay, so this is now a talk on like the second. I, I do simulations and I also do structure solution, trying to solve structures, usually with less experimental data. And this might seem like these two things are actually not connected. I forgot to change the date, so forgive me. Okay, so basically I'm going to talk a little bit about history and preliminaries something about combinatorial homology modeling and mass spectrometry, combinatorial X-ray crystallography, how chaperonin works, and then just the sort of ending part about the whole idea of determining structure with less data. So basically, as is very well known, proteins are stabilized by known forces. These are two Scientific American pictures that I really love because I saw them when I was like 15 years old, and it was just amazing that a protein, something biological, was stabilized by physical forces. And, you know, it, it, it's pretty amazing. I also tell people that in those days, Scientific American had a, a way higher impact factor than nature or science or cell or combined. So, because of those colored pictures. No, they great articles. I'm not sure about that. I just, you think they were better then? Absolutely. I think we were different. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But it, I, I, how do you do the tr control? Anyway, so basically it all goes back to this energy function that I talked about on, on Sunday. And that uh, essentially um, there are these forces that describe structures. And if we had perfect calculations, we could really solve structures with less information. We would get the sequences and solve structures. But this also suggests that there, there's a whole in between field where you would, would like to solve structures with no information and on the other hand you can solve structures with all the information as was done by Kendrew and Phillips in these two cases but in between there's going to be a very broad range where you can use calculation to help inject molecular details into solving structure. So uh, this just shows my very first paper uh, with Schneer Lipson, where you basically just energy minimized two proteins, uh, showing that they were stable. So this is one of the first things one might want to do. Uh, another paper which came about 10 years later, and this is, I guess, especially for, for Steve, who knew Tony Jack well, and I managed to get a really nice picture of Tony Jack. Uh, Tony Jack uh, was a scientist in Cambridge uh, working on crystallographic refinement, and uh, together we wrote a paper on, on refinement. Uh, Tony actually, I think, died before the paper was published. He certainly died in the same year of a sudden heart attack at the age of 30. Um, but his method has gone on to become the standard in, in different incarnations. And uh, the basic idea was to realize, that, so up till then, people had been solving structures by least squares. And although everyone says least squares, they forget that they're actually minimizing something, certainly early on. They would just solve simultaneous equations that were the least squares <coughs> equation. But least squares is minimizing. And you can apply, therefore, instead of just solving least squares, you can do minimization, in which case you can solve problems that are not squares. They're just sums of anything. So the idea that Tony and I had was to basically add the crystallographic R factor, which I'm going to talk about. So in crystallography, you measure intensities by diffraction. It's quite easy to calculate these intensities if you have the coordinates. And then you can simply compare calculated intensities with observed intensities. And that gives you an agreement index called the R factor. And the low R factor means your model is a good model. But this ends up being quite important in what I did. Anyway, Tony worked at a very clever way to calculate the derivatives uh, of the R factor with respect to uh, coordinates. Those days, you really needed derivatives because there was not enough computer time to use methods that were in any way more complicated. Okay. Uh, Collett and then Hendrickson uh, had methods that sort of were about at the same time. Uh, perhaps even, well, certainly more important was work that Axel Brunner did, 
uh, in a program called Explore. Uh, and that basically used very similar ideas that what we'd done, but basically injected molecular dynamics. So while we were using minimization, the idea would be you would refine a crystal structure by putting in a force field that would be the best force field you had, some term that measured agreement with crystallography, typically through the R value, and then minimizing a combined sum of those two. Okay. Uh, so basically, let me now jump a long time into the future, like maybe five or six years ago, and really mention things which came as a big, big surprise. Uh, combinatorial homology modeling. We, we know that is a term that wasn't around, but before thinking of the name, I did a lot of Googling, and there's combinatorial modeling and there's, combi and there's homology modeling, but those three words had not at that time been used together. So uh, what is it? Okay. So I'm going to talk about a system which is really an amazing, it's a, it's a molecule. It's a group two chaperonin. Chaperonin is a molecule that help proteins fold. And it's a group two chaperonin because bacteria have group one chaperonins. And archaea and eukaryotes have class two chaperonins. It's called CCT or TRIC. And I'm going to, these names, I have, even though I've been working on this for five or six years now, I have no idea. I don't easily remember what these abbreviations stand for but I have it written down. Okay, so this molecule is, is, is really interesting. So basically, group one chaperonins whose structures, I think Paul Siegler was very instrumental in solving the structures, uh, consist of essentially two halves. Each half has seven of these chains and a cap. This side is open, I've taken the cap off. This side is closed, but typically it's like an elongated rugby ball uh, that can close. And the idea is, is that an unfolded protein gets into this cavity, the cap comes on, ATP is catalyzed, and out pops a folded protein. Um, the class, the group one chaperonins, all have, each of these colored subunits is actually identical. So each of these chains of about 400 amino acids is completely identical, and the lid are separate seven units of a smaller protein. The group two chaperonins are actually similar. This particular unit is actually quite structurally homologous and sequence homologous to this about maybe 25%. Uh, but in this case, there is no lid. The entire shape opens and closes. So this is the open form and this is the closed form. I've just shown the two together. Okay. And this is just looking at it, what it might look like where both sides are open and both sides are closed. It is quite a large object. It's about 116 nanometers across. Okay. This is just a movie made by uh, Junji Chang, who's now an independent professor uh, in Texas, but he was a postdoc with Hua Chu and solved the structure. And during his, you know, he was a PhD student with Hua Chu, and while he was there, he made this movie just showing how uh, chaperonin kind of uses ATP to open and close. Now, this is an archaeal chaperonin where all the subunits are the same. So there are eight subunits, and they're all the same. What's amazing is that, and this just shows you what the closed form looks like. This is a movie that actually Nia made. Okay. So what is so amazing about chaperonin? So you carry it, archaeal chaperonin usually consists of one and sometimes two different subunits. So if it's all one, it's just all alphas, and if it's two, it goes alpha, beta, alpha, beta, etc. Or eukaryotic chaperonins have eight subunits. The overall shape is extremely similar. I think I just used exactly the same shape and changed the coloring. But basically, so you have this thing where you've suddenly got eight genes, because you have eight different subunits. You've got to have eight genes for an object that managed perfectly well in Ikea with one gene. Okay. And the different colors here are about 30% identical. So say red and blue are 30% identical almost as much as they are identical to the archaea, but all the blues are 60% identical across species. So you've got a concern. These colors are not just there by chance. They each one is doing something special. So this is really interesting. And it's particularly interesting because we don't even understand really how chaperones work at all. You know, there's a box, you open it up, you throw the protein in, something magic happens and out it jumps. Uh, this machine seems to be much cleverer. Okay, so once you have a system that consists of eight different genes, the obvious question to anyone who's even slightly interested in mathematics is what is the order? 
And that turns out to be a very hard problem. So why is it a hard problem? Well, there's two reasons to say that a problem is hard. One reason is that people get it wrong. So I'm going to start with that explanation just because the slides happen to be in that order. Previous structural work. So there were two attempts, recent attempts, to find the order of these subunits in uh, chaperones, mammalian chaperones. There was a study that used bovine chaperone, and that was basically senior authored by uh, Steve Ludka, Judith Friedman, and Wa Chu. They used what they called four angstrom cryo-EM, but it was done before there were good detectors. They did collect a million particles, got density maps, fitted sequence into density maps, and concluded that there was a certain order. About a year later, a group of crystallographers, again, in this case it was uh, yeast uh, CT. So it turns out that this group usually calls it trick, and the other group calls it CCT, and I could lecture for 10 hours on the sociology of the chaperone field. It's not pretty. Uh, in any case, um, the uh, crystallographer here is Lawrence Pearl, a very well-known crystallographer, senior postdoc was Karen Decker. They did something that was in some ways much harder. They collected 3.8 angstrom data on this huge object, got it to crystallize, and solve the crystal structure, and their order was different. Now you might conclude, okay, the molecule is different in yeast than it is in, in, in bovine, but you know, it's hard enough to design eight genes that are gonna fit together and start thinking about, I mean, the bovine, the, the bovine you know, blue gene is almost identical to the yeast blue gene, so what is happening? Okay. Mm, complicated, but this relates exactly to this slide. So Nia uh, came to my lab, and I'm going to say a few minutes about why he came to my lab. But one of the first pieces of work he did in the lab uh, was to take the sequences, and at that time there were 12, I think, or thir 14 sequences he collected, and look at for correlated mutations between the sequences. He basically just put the sequences into the... So, you, you know, if you've got this gray framework, you can stick any sequence you want and see, for example, if you put the red and blue next to each other, are there some correlations? And doing this, he concluded that there were, but the one that he felt strongest about was that particle Z and G are close together. Now, I now need to say something about the naming here. So here is a picture from the side of the chaperonin, and you can actually treat this as a cylinder, and now look at this as these colors going around a ring like this. Again, this alpha here just tells you that in Archaea, they're all the same, but they're different in things. Now, just to give you something about the name, uh, TRIC stands for TCP1 ring complex, where TCP1 ring uh, abbreviates the gene named T complex. I still don't know what T complex stands for, and I'm sure it's very well known to geneticists. Uh, CCT stands for chaperone containing TCP1. Uh, I'm sorry. Now, the subunits are conventionally labeled in Greek or by numbers. In eukaryotes, if it's yeast, they use numbers. If it's bovine, they use letters, Greek letters. Uh, we, uh, with our background in the protein data bank, were very happy to convert the Greek letters to Roman letters. And uh, that's really, really good. Except it's also very confusing. It's pretty easy, you know, A, B, G, D, E. But then zeta is the sixth letter in the Greek alphabet and the last letter in the Roman alphabet. And that is really very unpleasant. But anyway, we, we got used to the names. I don't think I remember them now. This is why I just say, you know, blue is next to yellow, red. Okay. So this is a complicated object because it can be put together in so many ways. We had one particular solution that came from cryo-M, another solution by X-ray, they were different. How many are there? Well, it doesn't take a lot of work to realize that if you have a ring of eight things, it can be done in seven factorial ways. The reason is that you can start anywhere in a ring. But then you've got the two rings, top ring and lower ring, and now they have to be joined together, and you can put A under any one of the other eight, so you get seven factorial times eight, which is 40,320. So you can, you can color this thing in that number of ways using each particle once. Okay. Now, here are the other arrangements. This was the arrangement 
that had been proposed by Friedman and Chu. This was proposed by the Willison Group. Uh, I actually am going to refer to, I have a, a convention, which I think is a good one to adopt. When things are wrong, you refer to them by the senior author. And when things are right, you refer to them by the first author. So uh, this is the LFC model. This is the PW model for Pearl Willison. And then Nia and I, basically, all we concluded was is that it was one pair that was together. This was done, I think this was a paper that was written because Nia wanted to go to Hawaii. And he wrote it really, really quickly. So I think we came to, met in a cafe in Rehoboth and it was written like the next day. Okay. So the Pacific Symposium for Biocomputing does have a real scientific value. Okay. So it's a hard combinatorial problem, as I just said a few seconds ago. And the way it was sold, oh God, this is a mistake. This should be mass, mass spectrometry. I keep on mixing these up. I even forgot about that. Basically, I know nothing about mass spectrometry or spectroscopy. Uh, Mia came to my lab in 2006, and this is actually the proposal that he sent. Now, normally people would join my lab. No one sends me a proposal, but Nia did. And I know nothing about this. I have no idea why he wanted to do this. It was not interesting. But as I said on uh, Sunday, Nia is a scientific grandchild, and you do what grandchildren want. So I said, of course you can join the lab. But then, of course, he actually wanted to do this. Uh, so he started to do it, and, and uh, it turned out to end up being really, really successful, but it was a complicated business. So, so we did what we call amateur mass spectrometry. I got it right. <laughs> and the reason is, is that mass spectrometry is done by specialist groups, so one Woody Ebersolt and others, Repspilla, who do this really, really carefully. And the other thing is that cross-linking mass spectrometry, for reasons that I haven't actually looked up, has a really bad name. It must have done some really bad things 10 years ago. Uh, but we didn't know this. Okay. So the basic idea is really, really simple. If you have two subunits, say a blue one and a red one, and there are two lysines fairly close, then you take this molecule called BS3, and you cross-link, you, you just mix it with this, it cross-links lysines, you then expose it to trypsin, and from the masses of these fragments, which you can get very accurately in mass spectrometry, you can tell which fragments are cross-linked. Okay. Now, it turns out that, before we go there, the, the actual experimental work involved is, is, I don't think it's very difficult. Nia actually went, got a, a bench in, in, in Roger's lab and did the cross-linking himself. Um, we managed to get the material that we were cross-linking through a, a collaborative grant that we had with uh, Judith Friedman and Wachu, uh, one of the NIH Nanomedicine Roadmap Awards. And he then took that. Now, what was really nice about mass spectrometry is that most places have one. They use it for organic analysis. They use it for getting the masses of things. Cross-linking was, at certainly the time we did it, extremely unusual. So all we did is we basically near got friendly with the guy running the mass spec center at Stanford, and he then basically just took this material, and he, did you do the trypsin digest? I forget, did he do the trypsin digest? He did the trypsin digest. So basically, this was, you know, near did that, and all the rest was then done by the mass spec center, except when you do mass spec, you give them sample, and they give you back a file, like five gigabytes, a very large file, binary data, telling you what are the masses of all the possible fragments. And uh, this just shows what mass spec does. It basically just simply measures very carefully the masses of, of different fragments, also ionized in different ways. And basically, it, it you, you hopefully find a fragment like this, and then by fragmenting it another way, not just by trypsin, but by actually using a small amount of uh, neutral gas in the, in, the chain, in the beam, you break it up again, and then you get lots of subfragments. So if everything is perfect, you find the mass of this, and then you find the mass of KK, and the mass of all the different cuts. It doesn't always happen like that. So we knew we were amateurs, and being very aware of this, Nia had a, had a really good idea. So we, we did this. And Nia found there were 60 cross-links. He had this program he wrote himself in MATLAB that did the analysis. And uh, we had long arguments about why he was using MATLAB. But he said, I would have used Perl, so there's no real difference and whatever. Okay. So basically, his idea was, was you find 
60 cross-links. What is the false rate? They are going to be some that are wrong, because this process, by just by chance, there are so many fragments. Again, this is a very big system. The entire structure is about 4,000 4, amino acids. So the number of different masses is just enormous for trips and digest. So what he did, I think, was, was really clever. He said, let's just imagine that the cross-linker was a different molecular weight, a wrong molecular weight. What would happen? Now, the professional mass spec groups actually use isotopically labeled cross-linkers. So then every peak occurs doubled. Every real peak occurs doubled, or maybe even three isotopes, so that you get more. We didn't do that. All that Nia did was, in the computer, he just said, well, let's just add one to the mass of the cross-link, and you know, the number of cross-links just drops like crazy. He also tried reversing the sequence. So this indicated that you never got more than about three incorrect cross-links out of 60, no matter what you did by trying to find errors. So that showed that the error that we're finding is about 5%. So basically, you get all these distances from the sequences. I mean, you get all these cross-links from the sequences. You can you know, see who's what. You can know what names there are, etc. Okay. So uh, Nia also had a way of ranking them based on their fragmentation patterns, something called the mass spec consistency score. Okay. So it turned out fairly early on this process, Nia said, oh, it's really, really easy to get the order of the eight subunits without doing any work at all. In fact, he said his daughter, who at that point I think was four or five, could have done it easily. And, you know, I thought he was exaggerating, but actually it's true. Now, I don't know if it's true about your daughter having done it easily, but certainly it's easy to explain to people how you might do this. So imagine you have eight different subunits. Now you just look at the crosslink. So this first, and you don't think about distances, you don't think about anything. The first crosslink it involves a peptide in B and a peptide in D. So let's just say B and D are next to each other. The next one says that A and G are next to each other. And then B and E, well, because B and D are connected, if you're going to put B and E, okay, so you make all these connected. Just by going down to about here, I think, you've got all these. And H never fits anything. There are no links to H. Now, because B and D and B and E are connected, obviously you've got, sorry, so first, uh, yeah, you get this connection. And from here you get B, D, and A, D, you get this one. So basically you can just, if these are colored building blocks, you'd have no problem just like, joining them together. And then you've got this one, and finally there's a cross-link here, which, so basically just from this and linking them up together, you get that. Okay, now H doesn't join anything, but because it's a ring, if these seven are connected, H must be at the end. So with almost no work whatsoever, you get this order. And that's pretty amazing that something like 10 cross-links on a structure as huge as this actually give you... And the reason is the colors are always kind of one-dimensional. I mean, we're not asking for detailed structural information at this point. We're just asking for order. Okay. And, uh, of course, when we actually did this, there was one... We did actually get to the model. I'm going to say that in a second. But there was actually one cross-link uh, out of our 20 that we looked at that was wrong. You expect an error rate of about 1 in 20, so that was, again, a nice feeling. Okay. So let's just do this properly now, not at the... F but how do you know which one is wrong? There's just one distance that doesn't fit the model. But this, perhaps I should have told you what we do about fitting the model first, so we, we, we'll see. Okay, so that was the wrong order. So now let's do this properly. So it turns out that cross-linking uh, is actually very, very lenient. The linker is pretty long, and if the C alphas of two lysines are within 28 angstroms, you can form a cross-link. So 28 angstroms is like the diameter of myoglobin, but this molecule has a diameter of uh, 170 angstroms, so it's, it's fine. So what we did is we used two different criteria for ranking our structure. So the idea is, is by homology, when I say combinatorial homology modeling, we're not going to try to deduce anything. We're just going to generate all... 40,340, whatever, 20 different models, and then ask whether how each model fits the mass spec data. So we will look at all pairs of lysines, and if the lysine is said to be cross-linked, we will ask, is that distance less than 28 angstroms? And if it's less, we'll say, no violation. But it turns out that's a very hard rule, because imagine the distance was 28.1 angstroms. So we use a second index, which is just the sum of the violation distances above the threshold. 
So in that case, 28.1 would count as 0.1, and you know, 128 would count as 100. So you'd get these two indices. And it's actually useful to have two of these indices are related, but they do provide a way of spreading out the structures. Okay. So when you do this, you get this picture. So this is, each of these dots is one of the 40 plus thousand structures. Every one of these has a different ordering because that's how we built them. And we can now put them on this, it's like, it's like fractionation, paper chromatography. We're basically, along this axis is how many violations, and along this axis is the sum of violation distances. So we do actually find one that's best. Well, you have to find one that's best. This is not surprising. Uh, we call the best one uh, OMS for optimal mass spec order. Actually, on here, we can now look at where the orderings that were found before the Lutke Friedman Chu ordering of this actually appears here, and the Per Willison ordering appears here. So we can certainly say that the mass spec is not fitting what was seen by EM and crystallography. Of course, they worked really, really hard, and so far we've hardly done anything. So, you know, we, 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 we have to be a little bit more careful before saying they're wrong. Um, okay. It's also interesting that the second best and third best are exactly the same as this, but one, the, the rings are the same, but in one case it's dislocated by one to the left, and in another case by one to the right, which again makes sense. You just build homology models. I mean, essentially, if you have a frame, so basically what you do is, it's an important question. You take Archaea, which looks exactly like this, very well-solved crystal structure, and you build a homology model where basically you color these, or you build side chains on these and the right. Well, now, we did some clever things. So, for example, when you look at the alignments, there are some deletions. We basically said something which was deleted in one subunit is deleted in all subunits. These subunits also have long, sticky tails, a bit like histones. We threw those away. So we basically were very conservative and only built homology models for the core residues. It turns out the core residues are about 90%, so it wasn't, it wasn't a terrible sacrifice. Okay. Uh, so you could end up with this, but this, you know, I guess as I've got older, I've come to realize that the science that I really should have learned was statistics, and, and I continually need to learn statistics. In fact, you were talking about Scientific American. I remember, it must have been in the late 70s, reading about bootstrapping. There was a paper in Scientific American by Efron on bootstrapping that was like, wow. So anyway, well. so it turns out that uh, if you don't know what bootstrapping is, you're going to need it anyway. Okay, so the idea was the following. Here we have this list of distances. What we, we, we don't really care what the best sequence is. <coughs> we care how much better the best one is than the second best. I mean, that's what really matters. So what we are looking at here is, we're going to take, let's just say we were to be very conservative, just take the top six distances and do the entire modeling again, just with those six distances, get the best one and the second best one. And then repeat that by bootstrapping those six distances. Now, what bootstrapping is, is very simple. If you were to choose six distances, you don't just take your six distances. You create a six-sided dice, throw it six times, and don't worry about repeats. So if you throw a six-sided dice six times, you'll probably get like one, you know, no three, two twos, a four and a five, perfectly fine thing. You would just repeat out of the data. So you'd actually say, okay, this cross link occurs twice, this one doesn't occur, etc. And you can do that many, many times because there's many ways of doing it. And you can just simply ask, overall, how often do you get a best one versus the second best one? And what we found is that if we had anything less than 14 of these cross links, typically the best and second best one would occur pretty much evenly. As soon as we got to 15 and 16 crosslinks, this one occurred 90% of the time in our bootstrapping sample. When we went further, we started to do less well because we were bringing in, we knew that 20 is the limit of the accuracy. So if you start bringing in wrong crosslinks, you're going to start to favor other structures. So it's perfectly logical. So we felt this was a very, very convincing idea that we were at least 90% certain that this was right. Okay. And when you actually look at it, it's kind of amazing because here are pictures that near drew of the cross links on the same scale as the structure. 
And, you know, we were very lucky. There's actually only one crosslink between the two rings, which is why the it's very easy to get the false structure. This particular unit interacts with itself, and it interacts with itself in by chance in ways it couldn't actually interact with itself. This point cannot be next to itself. It's the same point that interacting, which again was very lucky, because if it had interacted with itself so over here, it could have done it like this or like this. So we were, we were lucky, anyway. So, it was okay, interesting, but we suddenly realized that these combinatorial methods are very, very powerful. It's a way of exploring spaces where you, you know, you're exploring the space at a somewhat of a coarse level, but you're completely unbiased. We also began to realize that one of the secrets of solving structures with less information is to avoid bias. And it turns out that both, if we go back to, kind of really into, if you ask why were these previous attempts wrong? Well, it turns out you can actually understand the sociology. The arrangement that was reached by the uh, Friedman Chu group was actually very similar to a model that they had proposed a few years before. And the arrangement reached by the Williston group was again very similar to a model that they'd proposed a few years before by very weak indirect evidence. I don't think they'd realized that there are 40,000 ways of doing this. And the reason is, is that the data, if you only look at a single model, the data is not strong enough to exclude that model. Lots of methods are good enough to tell you that that's the best model, but aren't good enough to say it's the wrong model, unless you have other models to compare it against. So what is combinatorial crystallography? Okay, so again, we're going to depend very much on the work of Willis and co-workers. In this case, I'm going to certainly acknowledge Karen Decker, who was the person who did all the work. She collected all the data. Uh, when I later spoke to Lawrence Pearl, who's a well-respected crystallographer, he actually said that he didn't know that the order was in any way disputed. So uh, again, indicating how this bias can get in. Now it turns out, when you look at the crystal structure, it is quite bad because it's P1 symmetry, which means that there's no symmetry in the crystal. But even worse than that, there are actually two of these huge, this is, you know, almost a megadalton, complexes in the crystal. Now it turns out that this is what was seen, this is from the supplementary work of uh, Decker et al. But if you look, just look at the other unit cell, it turns out that there actually is almost a perfect diamond, which is not used by the crystallography in the unit cell. So we just decided for, 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 for aesthetic reasons to treat this as the asymmetric unit rather than, it doesn't matter, as long as you choose one of each kind, it doesn't matter which way you do it. So now our object of interest are two of these, and in crystallography, you're not looking at distances, you're looking at absolute location. So if you rotate something in the crystal, it's different. So now you have eight factorial of these, 40,000 of these, and this can be rotated in eight different ways. And for each rotation, this can be rotated in eight different ways, giving us something like two and a half million different ways. Now again, if this thing rotates as a rigid body, you can just simply move the coloring around. So it, 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 it it's all can be handled in terms of coloring. And this means that you can look at this horrendously complicated atomic structure as being four subsequences. Uh, in general, uh, they're always the same, but you can achieve rotation by just moving the subsequence around. So the idea was to look at um, something like two and a half million of these sequences and try to find which is the right one. Now, what are we going to do? So it turns out I actually had my PhD in Cambridge with Bob Diamond, and Bob Diamond did a lot of very, very nice early work in crystallography. He had a refinement method uh, that actually did what was called in those days real space refinement, where instead of refining against the structure factors, you would re kind of refine against electron density. And an important theorem in, in crystallography is that the agreement of the structure factors, this R factor, is related to the agreement of density. Now there's a problem here, and that is that this is actually a complex number, and this is actually a real number, but if the phases are almost the same, you can basically say that being close in the density map is the same as being close in diffraction space. Okay. Now, this means you can try something potentially very simple. So the idea was, 
and this started out in a, in, a, in a slow way, was basically to take the models of Pearl Willison, Friedman Chu, and our mass spec model, and try to refine the models against the crystal data. We used Axel Brunner's CNS program. The initial uh, R values were all around 48%. You could say this one was a tiny bit better. And on refinement, this one did better, but you know, no one in their right mind would say this proves it's right unless you really believed it was like that, and this is not interesting. So then we realized that the actual structure of the ob object gives you a way to test this, because if you have a particular sequence, there are still 64 ways of putting the sequence into the unit cell. Not only that, let's imagine you get this one right. There are still eight, there are still seven ways of having this one wrong, because these are two independent rotations. Okay. So then you can do this, and instead of refining one model of each, sorry, you can actually refine you can refine eight times eight models of each. So basically, so basically, when you do that, you would expect to see a pattern like an X. And when you use these sequences, which in this case is the Pearl Willis, and in this case the Latka Freeman True, and this is actually looking at uh, either the free R value or the R working R value, we find a very nice plus pattern. Initially, we actually looked at the free R value after refinement. Each of these points takes about two days on a decent workstation. It's slow. So you can get 64 if you have a few workstations and you can get them. But this started to make us feel that this is looking very interesting. Now, it turns out that you can actually, if you use the real R free after refinement, the signal is much stronger. And this is what we first focused on. We suddenly realized, though, that if we just use the initial R value, no refinement, the initial R value, we're still seeing a signal. It's weaker. This, these are signals measured in... So th this is 3% in R value terms. So the R value expresses the percentage times 10. So 3 of 3 is 0.3 of the R value. Very small. It's much larger if you refine. But this refinement takes a lot of computer time. Calculating the R value of the initial structure is potentially cheap. Now, it turns out that Axel Brunner's program, CNS, does this in 24 hours and this in two hours for each point. So very slow. But people have been calculating R values for a very long time. And there's no way that back in the 1960s, they took two hours of present-day computer time to get the R value. And lo and behold, there are other methods we found a program called SF Check, written by Shoshana Vodok and Manin, and they, it can actually calculate the R value of this object in 10 seconds. Today we now do this on GPUs, and we can calculate the R value in 10 milliseconds. So it, it, the R value is a very easy thing to calculate. Now, of course, if we hadn't have had these initial signals, you'd be very skeptical about calculating the R value, even with these initial signals, People said it's never going to be sensitive enough. Okay. So this is what's interesting here that it actually is. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to build detailed models for all 2.5 million arrangements. All the atoms are there. These, atoms, these side chains have been put on using Dunbrack's Squirrel 4. We didn't do any refinement. We basically built the models identically. The key thing in unbiased work is never drew anything to one model that you wouldn't do to all the models. So the things have to all be relatively cheap. When you do this, you get a lot of values. Um, initially, this was done using something like 12 seconds per R value. It took a few weeks on the cluster we had then. And basically, under this gray histogram, which is shown on a linear scale, there are two and a half million points. It's hard to see anything. But if you put it on for a log scale, the singles can stand out. And you actually see that you know, under these tails, there's a lot of data. Now, looking at this, you see that there is a lowest value. But in terms of percentages, everyone sort of knows that the R value for random structures is 50%. And this is what you get. I mean, this is between 49.9% and 51.1%. But if you actually look at this and treat this deviation as a Z value, it is something like 11 standard deviations from the standard deviation of the grade distribution. 
Furthermore, if you look at this very carefully, this is not symmetrical. Uh, if you take the log of a Gaussian, you expect it to be a quadratic upside down. So this should be a perfectly symmetrical uh, quadratic function, but it's not. There are extra values over here. So we decided that we, and it did actually turn out that the best one was our arrangement that we'd found. But we still weren't happy. It's really great to be self-critical because you get to do all this fun stuff. So we ended up saying, just take the top 10 cases. Every one of these is a different sequence, a sequence of structures. What is the consensus? Uh, just to show you. Okay. So we did that. These are just these ring sequences. And we're just basically showing you the best one, which had an R value of 0.497, second best one, etc., out to the tenth best one, which is, again, differs from that one by 0.2% in the R value. Really tiny. But now if you look at the sequences, it's absolutely clear that this column should be B, this column should be D, A, G. Everyone knows the difference, so you're never going to get any repeats. So basically, it's very, very clear. It doesn't always happen in every case, because there's different data for each of these, but the consensus of the top 10 is always exactly the same as the best one. It turns out it doesn't really matter what you do with that consensus. You can take the top 1,000. You can bootstrap them. You can, it's, it's very, very robust. Consensus of sequences are, by their very nature, very robust things. Okay. So we then took the density map. We brought into the problem uh, Gunnar Schroeder, who is somebody who's used a method called DEN. He's worked with Axel Brunner and I. And using that, he was able to take the structures and refine them. And when he did this, he eventually found that uh, he was able to get our structure down to an R3 of 28.4%, which was a lot better than we were getting for the other cases. And uh, if you then actually look at the density in his goodness picture, in the density that was done by Perlin Willison, essentially they didn't see any side chains. In fact, I think they only saw 40% of the phenylalanines. Note to crystallographers, if you don't see most of the phenylalanines, there's a problem. Uh, and of course, once we've got the density, we're seeing all the side chains very beautifully. Okay. So it looks good. Now, just to show the structure, but we were still not happy. We thought, could we do better? Because there was actually crystal data for the open form. It had been done, I'll come back to that in a second, by Volk West and colleagues uh, in Spain, and they had solved the open form uh, I think, I forget what the source was. Remember what the source was? Was it human or? Bovine. Bovine as well. And they solved this uh, in a complex with tubular. Now, they didn't even think about allocating sequence. So they just deposited in the PDB the C alphas. They didn't try. One of the nice things about their density is that they actually do see where the tubular is. And in, in fact, in Willison's density, he actually saw where the actin is in their map. So if you knew what the subunits are, you can start talking about function. Now, this just seems like it's a crazy idea. I'm not even sure why we did it. But basically, uh, I just wanted to mention that my sort of hero of science is Max Perutz. And for many, many years, Max used to walk around with a plywood model of his structure. It was sort of interesting that he helped Kendrew solve my globe to very high resolution, but in no way was involved in any of the papers. Perutz was also... Crick's supervisor when Crick did the DNA paper, and his name is nowhere to be seen. It's actually stuck in the back of his thesis as a sort of afterthought. You know, Max was an amazing man, but in some ways, you could sort of see uh, CCT as being sort of like a super hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is uh, about 500 residues, and it's got two alphas and two betas, and CCT is uh, you know, 35 times bigger, and it's got two alphas, two betas, two gammas, two <coughs> deltas, etc. So it's sort of similar. And they actually do both have symmetry and so on. Okay. So uh, we looked at this open form, did exactly the same thing. Now, it's a little bit easier in this case. We just took their C alphas, decorated them with the right sequence. And in this case, uh, there are only one molecule in the asymmetric unit. So the only, you only have to look at 6 times 8 factorial, which gives you something like uh, 300,000. And looking at this, boy, this looks like there's no signal whatsoever. Remember I said if it's a beautiful parabola, it means it's a really, really good Gaussian. And the best value here turns out to be three standard deviations or four standard deviations. For, for 300,000 points, three standard deviations is nothing to get excited about. So we tried our technique again of looking at the top 10. And much to our surprise, 
the consensus still gives you the right arrangement except for one error. That's as close as you can be. So the, consen the correct arrangement is like this, and the consensus gets it all right except in this column it should have had a Q, so there are three Qs and five Es, and this one should have been the other way around. It got it wrong. So we were, we were, we were pleased that at least we got it as, as close as it was, and that the structure was, in fact, correct. Okay. So this is important because it means you now, in the structure, know what the letters are, what, who these are. So now you can start to think about the function of this molecule. That's the closed form, which we'd solved at 3.8, the open form at 5.5. We now know what colors are where. And we can now sort of try to say how the molecule works. So it turns out that this is a really interesting system. It's, it's a pity that uh, it's so peripheral to science and the field is so contentious because it is a really beautiful system for theoreticians where you have eight genes in the place of one, so all these evolutionary studies are really exciting. We actually collected sequences and you start to see that every one of the different subunits has things that are conserved to it that are not conserved to the other. So these start to explain the function. Uh, a lot of this function is how these fingers interact specifically with the substrate. And we're going to say a little bit about that, but not enough. Okay. So structure certainly explains function. So basically, there are two things this thing does. It has ATP binding, and it opens and closes. And it binds the substrate. So it turns out that the different active sites where the, the ATP binds are very, very different. Some of them have missing aspartic acids that are critical. They seem to be much weaker ATP binders than others. And in fact, Amon Horowitz and, and co-workers of the Weizmann Institute took yeast uh, chaperonin and knocked out a key aspartic acid in each of the subunits one at a time. And they found that for certain ones, it had hardly any effect on the viability of the organism, and for others, it was completely lethal. So the different subunits, their ability to catalyze ATP is differentially important. And this also suggests that one could actually calculate rates. And Ivan Ofimtsov is in my lab and is one of the major developers of a super fast packet for density functional theory called uh, TerraChem actually has done some quantum calculations and trying to see why these rates are different. He got involved in something else, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately. Okay, so the first thing we saw is, is that we just looked at how much contact there is between different subunits. And what you find is, is that the contact area, and it turns out for those of you who are still using accessible surface to measure contact areas, don't. The only way to measure contact areas is with, with a construction called Voronoi construction. And uh, this was first done by Fred Richards, who invented the Richards box in 1973 when he was on jury duty. South Chothi has pushed it very heavily. And essentially what you do is you just divide space up into polygons such that all the points in each polygon are closer to a particular atom, and then just ask what is the contact area of the face. And this makes the area totally additive. If you do accessible areas by leaving bits out, you don't get additivity. It's really hard to tell why something changes by leaving bits out. So this gives you a very, very good surface area, and you find that the total interaction between different units for the ZQ unit is much less than the others. So these are high, this is very low. What does that mean? It basically means, and this is something which you even could have seen in Willison's map, the ring is cracked in this closed form. And if you look at it from the top, one of the alpha helices, these are all straight, this one is really bent. And then you look at the interface, there's an arginine right in the middle of this hydrophobic interface. Amnon Horowitz did try to mutate this, and then a the student left or whatever. This is still unclear how important it is. We think it's very important for the function. Okay. So the other thing is that the ring, if you look at it from the top, is bipartite. What we mean about that is that both in the closed form, as solved by Karen Decker et al., and in the open form, as solved by Bob Perth et al., they, they know where the substrate is. In this case, it's tubulin. In this case, it's actin. And what happens is, is that in each case, it binds to the gray, brown, and blue subunits, Q, Z, G, or 8, 6, 3 in the other nomenclature. So it also turns out, and I've shown this here, this is how important the particular aspartic acid is in Amnon Horowitz's work. And basically, these matter very much. They're dark. These matter almost nothing. So essentially, this is where ATPase really is important. 
this is where it doesn't matter, and the substrate is bound there both on the open and the closed form. So basically you can show this in a, in a grammatic way that the ring is correct over here, and this is a slide that Netanyahu drew. You have these three subunits that are binding the substrate. This, these heights are a measure of how strong ATPase activity is. So then you have a very interesting model. I mean, you have a model that suggests, so now we make uh, eight fingers, and these are things at the top. Now some of them are just going to hold the substrate, and others are maybe going to move at different rates. They catalyze ATPase ATP differently. So let me think of a model of perhaps catalyzing folding that's much more like how you would untie a piece of string. You'd go forward, grab a particular residue, and move out. So although people in the field like to think that this particular chaperone is used to catalyze all sorts of really important foldings, I think it's there to get actin and tubulin to fold up, as do other people as well. It's just so specialized, and it just seems to me this is why you know, eukaryotes went to all this trouble Together. I'm sure there's a very good reason for why actin and tubin have to be in an activated state. Okay. Now, it turns out that we would have liked a model for this, but I ended up finding one. In Singapore, there's an art science museum that looks like that. And it actually has uh, seven rather than eight, or maybe it has nine, but some of the fingers are short, some of the fingers are long. So this is the model. The substrate binds over here. These diff have different levels of activity, and they lean forward, and they close it. Okay. Uh, just to summarize, we think we can solve structures with less data. These are the two things I just described. Right now, in work that's still ongoing, Nia is still working on threading side chains into electron density. Ivan is working on refining poor electron density maps. And Yana is trying to do cryolium refinement. So we still have an ongoing interest in refinement. Now, what I really wanted to talk about is today's tour. <laughs> because it is amazing. I, I put this together on the in the taxi coming up here. So here is Jerusalem. This is the old city. This is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is the Wailing Wall. And here is the city of David. So it's well out of the picture. This is just the Google map. But if you look, you can actually find this map, which now shows you the wall around the old city, the wall around the city of David, and here is the well. Now let's just go one further. There's another map. So if you actually look at this carefully, you can actually see the root of the tunnel and also the route of a dry path. The tunnel apparently dates back almost 3,000 years, and the dry route dates back more than 4,000 years. It's quite amazing. Um, so, here it is. So, the immediate question that a scientist has is, why does this actually happen? And I didn't have enough time to read, but certainly there were those who said they have no idea why this happens, because the wellhead is actually very well fortified. Okay, but it turns out if you look at the picture like this, it turns out that this tunnel is almost flat. The, the difference in height between the beginning and end of the tunnel is 30 centimeters. And I'm sure they got that by just scraping the bottom to make it flow at the, e at the end. The tunnel also follows a kind of rather circuitous path. Apparently it was built in two places and they met over here. So, why? So, it's not actually clear until you look at this particular picture. And it's actually amazing. This is a map that was made by <coughs> the British in like 1886, which is an amazing map of Israel, a contour map of the whole country. And here this just shows the same thing. We can now, here is the spring. This is the Canaanite channel. This is the walking tunnel. Apparently the water is no colder than 17 degrees and no deeper than up to here. And I have some extra headlights, and so I'm definitely going to walk it, so uh, that's me. Uh, my wife would tell you, when it comes to walking, never copy me. So, so, in any case. Okay, so, why? Well, once you see this, it's absolutely obvious. This is outside the walls, and this is inside the walls. This whole thing is very high. This is the lowest part inside the walls, and therefore they had to make a tunnel that's horizontal, just to basically take the water from outside the wall, where it would be vulnerable to sieging. Some of the articles said that this was to stop runoff of the water, and therefore, you didn't want the soldiers who were invading to be able to access the water. Looking at this, it's absolutely clear that this is what happens. But of course, you, know, you have to read your sources carefully. Anyway, I just wanted to end up by again thanking Nia, Gunnar, and Chris Adams, who runs the Mass Spec Center at Stanford. And thank you all for your attention.
questions? Uh, there is a recent structure of uh, group uh, complex from mitochondria, actually from Israel, from uh, the lab of uh, uh, Abdel Salam Azel, from our department, and together with the, the late uh, uh, Felix Polo. And interestingly, they show uh, that one of the, uh, first of all, it is a, a ball, a, a football shape. So you show the half football at the yeah. beginning. So it is a full football. Um, a football as in a spherical football or a rugby, a rugby ball? An American football. American. Yeah, or a rugby ball, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, not soccer. <laughs> I understand that. Okay. Uh, so it is, it is a, yeah. you show the, the yeah, half yeah. of that, yeah. so it is the full yeah. one. <laughs> and one of the subunit has different uh, structure and at the cup it is rotated outside. Okay. So it perfectly meet your idea. Of breaking symmetry. Yeah, yeah. F that, uh, f that it p probably needed for uh, yeah. to hold something or it, it is not clear for, for what, but this is a uh, well, thank, really, thank really you nice. Pointing that out because it yeah. is in PNAS. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I actually knew Felix pretty well from the Weizmann and I will look up this paper. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, you know, it, it one thing I tried to do, while we were doing this work, I was having difficulty getting funding, and I actually wrote a grant that was entirely dedicated to studying chaperonin. And then it got triaged, which basically means it was considered to be below, it had all this work in it, it was below the 50% cutoff of the group. But by the time I got the grant reports, which was maybe four months later, I was convinced I didn't actually want to work on it for the rest of my life. So this was the case where I got these negative reports. I said, oh, they are wonderful. They're so good. They, and they all pointed out that other people were doing this already, and I didn't have to waste my time doing it. They didn't quite say it like that. So it's, it's very difficult because I'm somebody who likes to work on methods. And, and as a result, working in only on a system is much harder. I don't know whether Nia's going to work on the system more. And I have interactions. It also turns out this field has a, it's a bit like Star Wars. You know, there's a good side and a bad side. And uh, I'm slowly trying to build together the good side so there's people I can, I can work with. But it's really fascinating, although I don't know how general it is. You know, how many other systems involve this combinatorial kind of issue and stuff like that. But thank you very much. Now I have another uh, qu uh, it's question about uh, the trip. So you show this tunnel, and I accept your idea that the digging was by having the water inside and dig until the water start to, to move on, right? This is the idea, how you make very, mm -hmm. very shallow, very uh, little, one, uh, little uh, angle. But the problem is that it seems that they dig from two... two they do, that's so right. So how yeah. you do that? Apparently, they, they, well, I read about that, and they said that you bang on the top. And GPS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think th they had the GPS, it's just the reception was awful in those days. Um, I think, you know, it, it's... It's not that, but it's, it's quite deep, but certainly, w I think they met, the point where they met, I think, oh, sorry. The point where they met was somewhere like here. Yeah. And maybe what they did is they just banged on the surface. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's interesting. One idea I had, which is very easy to test today, since they went horizontally, if by chance the stone, which is sedimentary rock, has a layer at that level, it makes it really easy. But of course, it's very likely that the sandstone that was lifted up got really buckled. So if for whatever reason the sediment is flat, we know how they did it. But I think it's extremely unlikely. So, you know, I don't know how they did it. Uh, and and very, very quick cool last thing is that the, the idea that to bring water into Jerusalem, into the, uh, the city, is also, it's, there is similar idea from a bit later time in uh, Megiddo. Yeah. Okay, where uh, uh, Achav uh, built the, the tunnel there. It and also uh, really uh, spring outside yeah. and it gets inside yeah. the hidden spring. It's also amazing how tiny this is. The whole city was half a kilometer across. Top. Can I, d could I return to biology? <laughs> if, if, if you insist. <coughs> um, so when you're making a, an acting molecule, is every acting going to be chaperone or is only a subset? I don't know. I, 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 I do you I know 
how it goes, how does it go out, when, how does it know how to go out, I mean... Uh, no, I, I, I wear my theoretician hat. No, but let me, let me <laughs> respond, <laughs> Michael. Look, in the first place, uh, the chaperones are only needed when there's misfolding. Misfolding can be detected by exposing, obviously, a hydrophobic yeah. region. When those are gone, it'll be released. I mean, that's plausible. I don't know whether, I haven't followed this field, and I don't know if these people are thinking along those lines, but they should. I but, think that's that's, but that's the general thought, okay. then why be so specific? But it brings up another point. I don't believe it is so specific, because actin is the most abundant protein in the cell, and you're invariably going to find it when you isolate this thing, but it doesn't mean that it's not doing the same job for everything else. This is part of the controversy, which I'm standing very far away from. <laughs> are there many copies? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, there are uh, these, I'm sure these are. Yeah, could well be, if it's used for actin, but that would would fit together. Seems like I'm going to have to learn some biology, which... Uh, huh? <laughs> seems like I'm going to have to learn some biology. I have a question regarding the real space refinement based on density and its connection to refinement uh, with regard to the structure factors there. Okay, so, so what we know is, okay, so we know this works. Okay. There's no doubt it works. Yeah. Uh, work that Mir is doing right now shows that you can actually distinguish between a single side chain on an aniline background, so it's quite sensitive. But we also know that we tried, so it turns out that this slide, for a long time I got this slide wrong. I didn't realize that this was complex and this was real. As a result, they're not the same unless the phase is small. And I thought this could be used for ab initio phasing. It turns out it can't, because even if you make lots of... So the idea was to make lots and lots of models that fit the data and average them. It doesn't work. We need to do something much cleverer. But, but Ivan, who's really, really gifted, is still plus incredibly obstinate. He's right now working on a, on a structure which Bill Weiss, who's a crystallographer in our lab, can't solve at four angstroms. And Ivan says he's going to solve it for him by lots of clever ways of, of, of using methods like this. Um, but it turns out, I think, that... So, it, so basically, in, in work that, that... You know, basically a change that's really tiny. What you can, for example, tell is if you truncate your side chains at a certain level of atom, the third atom from the main chain, you can see that. So it turns out that what is surprising is that although the signal is random, it's still got amazing sensitivity. So basically, one of the things we had to do was take the program that calculated the R value, that was printing it out to four decimal places, and change it to six decimal places, because there was signal there, for example. Yeah? With respect to the uh, looking for the cross-link, the best cross-link uh, arrangement, or arrangements, did you use also, in that case, brute force algorithm or a smarter no, it was it was pure what we call combinatorial homology modeling it's a smart name for a stupid technique we just made all the models it turns out in that case you can do the whole thing in about half a second in Perl it's very easy very quick there's only, there's only 40,000 and these distances are very easy to evaluate with a little bit of indexing and whatever the other nice thing about combinatorial models are they all built up pieces of other models so FOSC algorithms just abound all the time. We did nothing brute force. Again, the idea was, and I don't, you know, we, we never, for example, tried to refine the model based on the distances. We just simply said, does it fit or does it not fit? At that point, we were only trying to get the order. And it also turns out that subsequently, at about the same time, uh, Ebersolt and co-workers uh, actually did it properly. And instead of finding 20 crosslinks, they found about 150 crosslinks. And again, I think Neil would say now that if he did it again today, he would have found many more crosslinks because it was like his first time pipetting. Um, but in that case, we used exactly the same statistical methods. And there you can show very easily with 100 crosslinks that the best model is always like 10,000 times more likely than the second best model. So you get very good discrimination. Okay.
Thanks.